Let me say good morning to you yet again. It is 1040, as we normally do. It's about five minutes before our official start time at 1045. For those of you who are returning back with us from being in Sunday school with us, good to have you again. If this is your first time being with us this morning, we want to say we welcome you and good morning to you. We pray that something from God's word can be said uh, that can be a benefit to you as a believer and help you on your Christian journey. We thank all of you, the membership included, the guests and friends. We appreciate all of you for even considering being a part of our live stream and trusting us with our Bible teaching to be something that is pertinent and something that is sound doctrine that can hopefully give you a sure footing in a slippery world. Today, we're going to talk about a very practical subject, one that I believe all of us uh, have had experience in failing at. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the discipline of restraint. Uh, good morning to you, Sister Scott. We're going to talk about the, the, the blessing of restraint. Excuse me. Having restraint is a form of discipline. And we're going to look into God's word. We're going to see an example to where one of God's men got angry and he got angry about the right thing. There's a lot of stuff to be angry about, to be upset about, to be frustrated and annoyed with. People aren't always angry about the right thing. So we're going to look into God's word this morning. We're going to be in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Oh, yeah, you're going to need your Bible. Nehemiah. I'm drinking my Cuban coffee this morning. I'm fancy. Uh, we're going to need you to turn to the book of Nehemiah chapter 5. Our key verse is going to be verse 7, but we're going to look at verses 1 through 7 to give you the full context, context, context. And I say that all the time. When you're going to look for a home, the three words are location, location, location. When you study God's word, the key word is context, context, context. So we're going to see just why Nehemiah got mad. What was going on? How did they find themselves in this place? And yes, people, God's man got mad. Let me say it a different way. The preacher got mad. The pastor got mad. The deacon got mad. The choir member got mad. The musician got mad. People get mad. My goodness, Lord have mercy. You're going to make me preach before I preach this morning. So <laughs> fill up your coffee cups. We're going to get started here in just about three or four minutes. And we're going to dive into what the word of God says. And we're going to see how we can use this and apply it to our daily living. So I bless all of you. I pray everyone has had a peaceful rest. A good morning. That that Sunday school lesson about spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12. It, it's just so much more I wanted. Uh, we could have taken that and compared it to Ephesians, compared it to 1 Corinthians 7. Compared, it's just so that that's a very exhaustive subject that needs to have great attention paid to it. You know, but nonetheless, we've 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 made it past it out. I, I hate not being as thorough as I would like to be. Uh, oftentimes, I've done this last week. I, I won't even do the whole 20 verses. No, no, no. We need to focus on these verses right here because let me tell you, this is going to get us through. So nonetheless, nonetheless, go ahead and get your coffee. Good morning to all of you. Oh, looks like we might have a little bit of sunshine. We'll see. We'll see. Just a little bit. Once again, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter five. I'm going to read verse seven, which is kind of the end or the culmination of what happened. But that's where our subject is based on how Nehemiah responded in verse number seven. We're going to look at that. So Nehemiah chapter five and verse number seven, we've almost made it there. I want to ask you again to please remember in your prayers to uh, remember to pray for the Turner family, the Brown family, on the passing of their family member, Sister Joyce Cleveland. Uh, please keep them lifted in your prayers. Uh, going through a difficult time, uh, I was able to be there with them yesterday. Um, wonderful spirit-filled service. Uh, certainly quite a few family and friends and church members. Uh, a lot of New Hebron was able to come out and to be with them in Mariana. Uh, just remember that family in your prayers going through a lot this morning. Uh, good morning to the good sister, Sister Burnett. 
Hope you and Brother Burnett are doing good this morning. Hope you made him some coffee. Got him breakfast in bed with the, the, the turkey sausage and eggs with cheese and a big cup of orange juice with, with, with sonic ice. And give him a bell so whenever he's done eating, he can ring it for seconds to bring him some jelly. That's just my, that's just my, my prayer for Brother Burnett. Anyway, <laughs> maybe that happened, maybe it did. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, to all of you, we've made it to 1045. So I want to be respectful of the time. Uh, I want us to start on time. So let's have a word of prayer. Then we're going to go through our text for today. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for blessing us to come together to study your word. Uh, I pray that your spirit can rest on me, that he won't just be resident, but he'll be president, that he will lead out in preaching and teaching, and that I won't preach from my own human strength and effort, but under the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that your spirit can soften hearts, can give an understanding mind, so that when your word is expounded and expressed and taught and preached, it can land on good ground. Father, allow us to do what's only in our control to do, and we'll respect you and let you do what only God can do. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. Let every heart say amen. Amen. Sister Brown, good morning to you. To my cousin Tanya, good morning. You and John. Nehemiah chapter 5. Old Testament book. We get to see what we got here. First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Ezra. Then you get to the book of Nehemiah. Turn to chapter five of Nehemiah. I'm going to read verses one through seven. No, I'm just going to read verses. Well, I'll read verses one through seven because that's where we're going to be. Our verse to, to park at is going to be verse seven. Nehemiah 5 verse 1, and there was a great cry of people and of their wives against their brethren, their own people, the Jews. For there were that said, we, our sons and our daughters are many, population is growing. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some of, uh, some also there were that said, we have mortgaged our lands, our vineyards, our houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth. The word dearth is speaking of a famine. There's a famine in the land. So they've mortgaged their property to get money because of this famine so that they can buy things in order to feed their families. And they got big families. There were also those that said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute. And that upon our lands and vineyards, we've borrowed against our property to get money to pay for the king's tribute, which is taxes. Okay. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren and our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and vineyards. Our children have been taken as collateral. Our children have not been taken to pay off the debt to these loan sharks, our own brethren who we've borrowed money against. We didn't have the money to pay it back. So they took our land, the land and vineyards wasn't enough. So they took our children to have our children be slaves working for them to pay off a debt that we owe. And the debt that we owe is because they done jacked up the interest rate we can hardly pay. Plus our crops aren't coming in good. So we don't have a good crop to sell, to make money. It's all bad, Nehemiah. And when Nehemiah heard this verse six, I was not just angry. I was very angry. He was hot. Ooh, he was mad. When I heard the cry and these were, when I saw what was going on, he was upset. Now, here we go. The blessing of restraint, verse seven. But before I said a word, verse seven, Lord, help me with this. I consulted myself. Didn't say a word. Let me shut my mouth. Let me pray. Let me show some discipline, some restraint, 
some temperance, as Galatians said. After that, I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, you exact usury, every one of his brothers, you jipping your brother out of money. And I set a great assembly against them. That means I'm telling everybody. Everybody's going to know about this. I'm going to uncover this ugly thing and shine a light on it because this is just wrong. But our key verse is verse seven. When he was, ver he was angry in verse six, very angry, he consulted himself. He took a deep breath. He showed some restraint. Now, Nehemiah, known as the king's cupbearer, that was his profession, the Israelites taken away captive. God has now opened the door for them to return home to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. Nehemiah got permission from the king. God favored him. Nehemiah got wood and supplies from the king for us. God favored him. Nehemiah had papers of authority. So when people of the land would say, hey, what you doing? Where you going? The king has told me I can do what I'm doing. I got an official stamp. God favored him. They get back to Jerusalem. It's just a remnant of them. They were a nation in the millions and millions. Now it's just a few of them. Sin cost them, many of them, their literal lives. So Nehemiah has to get people organized. He has to get people uh, 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 in, in tune with the plan of rebuilding the walls, a city in this time that was not surrounded by their walls of protection. That would be like living in a neighborhood and all of your windows and go, uh, are, are not there and your doors aren't hung on the hinges. It's just a matter of time before somebody comes in. So as they're rebuilding the wall, He's got to worry about the outside presence of Sanballat and Tobiah making jokes about it. Man, if a fox jump up to that old raggedy wall to fall down, he's got the outside pressure of people who are criticizing the work. And then out of nowhere, as his mind is thinking about this, as his mind is trying to handle all of these moving targets, trying to make sure he's working, trying to keep people encouraged, trying to keep people motivated, trying to protect against the defense of possible marauders and attacks, trying to listen and deal with the criticism of people who ain't going to help you no way. Now he has an internal cry. Chapter five, verse one, there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against who? Their own brethren, the Jews. This is taking place while they have an awesome task to perform. And here, a part of what has happened with their rebuilding of the walls, they began to hear this cry. It's an indication of internal problems. And their internal problems was potentially slowing down the work of rebuilding the wall. Potentially, their slowing down of the work, not only did it increase their lack of protection, but it also put them in a position of where they were being disobedient. God had blessed them in order to rebuild the walls and they can't get out of their own way. You see, this is why when Jerusalem had problems and we can bring to more modern time in the church, when we have internal problems, they must be addressed. No, no, no. There are some small things, some misunderstandings that probably may not rise to the level of other things. But when you have a problem, that's why Jesus in the Beatitudes say, blessed are the peacemakers. We need to have people coming alongside or the individuals involved as quickly as they can to reconcile and to get that thing removed. Because Paul said in our Sunday school lesson last week, a little leaving leavens the whole lump. If you allow the sin of offense to remain in your church, if you allow the sin of misunderstandings and outright rebellion, one person against another to remain and you see it and you're aware of it and you don't know, a church grows, is strengthened, we'll say, in direct proportion with how it deals with its internal problems. And there are some things that you just got to address. You have to. 
Because if you don't address it, that small thing can eventually come back to halt the progress, the ministry, the glory that needs to be given to God that can be minimized because we're fighting with each other. There's a cry of people and their wives against their own brethren who are the Jews. So listen, these are not strangers taking advantage of them. These are their own people who are taking advantage of them. And how many people of you understand this fact I'm about, this point I'm about to make? When the ones closest to you cut you, it hurts a little deeper. It hurts a little different. People that are close to you, that you have confided in, that you have loved, that you have been in informal situations, that that's your family maybe, that you've gone on trips with, when they turn their backs on you, when they take advantage of you when you're down, it hurts. And when this happens in a church, it has the potential of minimizing the success, godly success that a church can have. We saw it in Numbers chapter 12. Who was it that came against Moses? His own brother and his own sister, Miriam and Aaron. And they began to campaign to the people. Who said God can only speak through Moses? I mean, I'm paraphrasing. We're just as smart. We know, you know, how to be used by God. Who says God is only going to use Moses? They were doing this, undercutting the leadership and authority of their own brother. And Moses didn't have to say a word. God showed up and God said, hey, y'all, come in, all three of y'all. If there's a prophet, I speak to him in dreams or in vision. But when it comes to my servant, Moses, number 12, I spoke to him face to face because I called him. Because I commissioned him, because you can clearly see I'm the wind beneath his sails. Why were you not afraid to go against him? So what did God do? God struck Miriam, Moses' sister, older sister, with leprosy. He didn't do it to Aaron. It's assumed by theologians that Miriam got that punishment because Aaron was just going along to get along. You know, you have those people in the church to where they just doing whatever the group say do. <laughs> that, that's Aaron. Miriam got the punishment because she was the instigator behind it. But at the end of that chapter, in verse number 15, because she had leprosy, God did not allow the glory cloud to lead them any further. They stayed at that camp until that leprosy cleared up. The movement toward the promised land was halted because of their internal differences. And the progress of the church can be halted when you have brother against brother, this family against that family, this group against that group. These sisters can't stand those brothers. And when you have internal problems, it hinders the congregation from doing what God would have her to do. This is their own brothers going against their own brothers. Then verses two, three, and four, we see a description more specifically of what was going on. They were having to buy things, sell things. They were having to mortgage their land to pay taxes. Well, for several reasons. One, verse number two, for there were those that said, we and our sons and our daughters are many. Meaning, I got a whole bunch of mouths to feed. I got a big family. Have you ever been there as a husband and wife or let alone a single parent? You got a child to feed. You got two kids to feed. You got three kids to feed. You got mouths to feed. Inflation has gone up. Gas is 310, 315 a gallon. You go buy a gallon of milk. That's going up. You go buy bottled water. That's going up. You try to buy them school clothes. That's going up. And you ain't got the luxury of having a little bitty infant baby. Even if you have a small child, the clothes may not be expensive. But how many folks know about that thing called child care? Oh, child care make you swallow a piece of ice whole every month. It is expensive. And you don't want to bargain shop if you can help it on child care. Because that's your child. I've been there before. We got big families. I got mouths to feed. That's one of the reasons we find ourselves in this situation. Then it talks about verse three. 
Some of us, we had to mortgage our lands and vineyards and houses. We had to borrow against it that we might buy food or corn. Well, why did you have to mortgage your land and your houses? Why couldn't you grow your own corn and vineyard or on your own land? Because there's a dearth, King James word, that means a famine. So even when we did grow crops, it didn't yield the fruit that it normally does. That's like when you go to work, inflation has gone up. Prices have gone up. Gas has gone up. Food costs has gone up. And while your food expenses have gone up, your check has gone down. It just makes the gap that much bigger. So not only was there big families, mouths to feed, not only was there a famine in the land, my check is smaller than what it should be and the prices have gone up on everything. Also, there's another reason why we found ourselves in this position. Verse four, we borrowed money to pay the king's tribute. We borrowed money to pay the taxes for the king. How many of us know about taxes? Taxes ain't going nowhere. So it's as if these families were having one problem compounded by another problem. And friends, this almost models the situation we are in now. Gas up, everything is up. Gas is back over $3 a gallon. While expenses have gone up, not many people are getting a raise. So you have to spend more money, but you're bringing home possibly the same or less money. And that pushes you to make decisions that otherwise you would not have made, but you got mouths to feed. Your survival is at stake. We can say in our time, your financial obligations are at stake because those kids can't eat hopes and dreams. They can't and they won't. Those kids don't eat, I would have went to work, I should have went to work, but I just didn't get paid today, I wanted to sleep. Kids don't eat off that. Mm -mm. You got mouths to feed. This is the situation that the Jews found them, themselves in. And here's the difficult part. This was at the hand of their own brethren. So the rich began to take advantage of the poor. The ones who had an excess began to use it as an opportunity of greed to get more from people who really didn't even have it in the first place. We would call this predatory lending. The, 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 the check cash in place that says, and I'm using fictional hypothetical numbers, we'll give you $100 a day, but pay us back $175 when you get paid. Like, man, that's, that's almost twice as much. Yeah, but you're in a jam. We know you need it. We got it. And if you want it, you have to go by our unreasonable terms. The rich people began to make these unreasonable terms to people who were desperate to the point to where verse five comes into play. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren and our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons, our daughters to be servants. Now, what does this mean? As I said earlier, they were now saying, okay, you mortgaged against your land. I got your land. You mortgaged against your vineyard. Couldn't pay me back. I'm keeping the vineyard. Don't you got some kids? You got some sons and some daughters. I'll tell you what I'll do. Rich, rich Jew speaking to the Jew that's not rich. I'll tell you what I'll do. You let your daughter come work for me for a little bit in my fields. You let your son come work for me for a bit in my field. And we'll say X amount of time, we'll call it even. So not only do you not have the tangible land and vineyards, not only do you not have the corn because what you are planting is hindered by a drought in the area, a famine, excuse me. Now your children have been sucked into this system to where who knows how long they'll be away trying to pay off a debt that mama and daddy were doing the best they could trying to avoid. And then we get to the situation of how Jared, excuse me, Nehemiah perceived this. Nehemiah was mad, y'all. And wouldn't you be mad? You see, all anger is not bad anger. 
All anger is not the wrong type of anger. There are some things that you're supposed to be angry about. There are some things that if you turn a blind eye to it and act like you don't see it, that ain't my business. The things sometimes you ignore, you allow to continue going on. When Nehemiah saw this, he was mad. Now, of course, anger is wrong when it's rooted in vengeance, self-righteous pride, uh, uh, condescension, shouldn't have any of that. But when you are angry, because you can see an injustice taking place in a place where it should not be, when you are angry, when you see the name of the Lord is not being glorified and honored like it should be by people that should do it, that is what's called righteous indignation. That is the right type of anger. Yeah, now be angry, James says, but sin not. Yes, we are angry. The key is to be angry at sin, to find yourself disgusted with sin so that you yourself in your anger don't fall into said sin. But Jeremiah, excuse me, I keep saying Jeremiah, Nehemiah was very angry. And I want to say to you people, there is a place where we're supposed to be angry. There is a place where we're supposed to be frustrated, annoyed, and upset. But as Christians, we are restrained from that ignorant, foolish, uncontrolled, unreasonable anger where you're cussing folks out, throwing stuff, when you just lose your composure. No, 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 no. You don't let yourself get there. That's not the point. You still are angry, but in your anger, you are able to articulate why you're angry, to explain this is what I'm angry about. Maybe your tone is not the smooth, melodic, normal day-to-day -day tone. You're working on that, but you still are trying the best you can under the circumstances to say, this is wrong. You are wrong. God does not approve. How dare you say that that should be done? That is not what God stands for. That's not what the church should do. The Bible speaks against that I'm not happy with that. My heart is in tune with, with, with God's heart to the best of my ability. And I can't condone what God does not condone, but I will condemn the same thing that God in the word condemns. And my friend, that is wrong. And that's where we find Nehemiah right there. He's very angry when he hears that children are being taken advantage of. When he hears that families that have a lot of mouths to feed and their crop hasn't come in because of a famine and there are other Jews who have wherewithal to help them, but they instead are taking advantage of them. And we got to walls to rebuild. We're trying to get this city fortified. We got Sanballat and Tobiah out there talking about us, making a mockery of us. We could be attacked at any moment. And here we are on the inside. Can't even get along. You see, one of the failures as I transition to the New Testament church, one of the failures that I have seen in some situations, in some churches, don't want to generalize, is that we allow sin to just sit and reside in the church and won't do a thing about it. Nobody has the courage, the spiritual boldness, the downright honesty to say, hey, y'all, come on now. And, and listen, as we kind of flesh that out at New Hebron, I'm the pastor of New Hebron, and I thank God for that. You don't always have to come get me. If there's something happening in the back room and I wasn't even at church, I didn't even know y'all met back there and there's two people can't get along and the third person is there, I don't mind coming. I certainly know that's part of my responsibilities. But while y'all are there, after all that preaching and teaching and praying and singing and, and, and spiritual study and, and spiritual growth, guess what? Y'all can fix that up. I do know sometimes you have people who are unreasonable and it may take a third or a fourth party coming in just to, all right, y'all, let's just make sure we don't overtalk each other. Sometimes, depending on the nature and the extent of what's going on, that may be a wise thing to do. But there are other things that sometimes can just be fixed on the spot. But the point is, we all, I pray, would develop in us a spirit, a desire to want to see peace amongst the members. 
to want to see peace. Listen, I love our deacons. L -l Listen, I I'm, 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 I'm going to say this. We are all men. We all, we different ages, different this, different that. Family sides are different. Family structures are different. But God has blended us together. Do we all see everything the exact same way? No. Because some of them don't even like the cowboys. So you know we have some good time talking with each other. I'm being lighthearted when I say that. Of course we see things differently. But I can say Deacon Smith, Deacon Brian Davis, Deacon Marcus Davis. Listen, certainly still want to throw in there Deacon John Gardner. I love them. Like who, who said that a pastor and the ministry of deacons can't get along? Says who? But oh, my brother or oh, my sister, if you ever been to the church when a pastor and the deacons don't get along, when there is open animosity, when there's open gossip and, and, and insults, oh, if you've ever been there, I'm praying for you. If you're in there right now, I'm praying hard for you because, boy, that affects the church. Doesn't that affect the church? It hinders the church. People can see it. People can see he don't like them and they don't like him. People can, and, and guess what? The carnal members of a church, and yeah, there are some. The unsaved members of the church, yeah, there are tares sown in among the wheat. They know what deacon to go to to help get their sinful agenda pushed. They know who to talk to. They know who to pull to the side. They know who to call because I have an advocate in him. I can't stay in the pastor. I know you can't stay in the pastor. We can't stay in the pastor. So at the next church meeting, here's what I want you to do. This is what I'm talking. Listen, if you act like that don't go on, you are fooling yourself. The point is, when that is going on, the church doesn't progress to the extent where she should. The ministries aren't flourishing to the extent that they should. God does not get the glory that he deserved. Nehemiah saw this in front of his face. And their literal lives were on the line. And Nehemiah was upset. So what did Nehemiah do? Let's, let's bring it to more modern times. What would people do today? Oh, they probably get on social media and give these cryptic messages. You know how preachers are. I think they know everything. Or the preacher would get on there with a cryptic message. I'm tired of these deacons that don't know their place. I'm the pastor. They're the deacon. Oh, I ain't talking about nobody. People will spread this mess to the world. They, they, they'll go to Cracker Barrel after church and talk about everything and everybody they can't like at the church. They can't stand and what they don't like. That's what many have done today. Probably more than I would care to even know if there was an actual statistic we could look at. That's not what Nehemiah did. In verse 7, he consulted himself. Well, is, is Nehemiah talking to himself? Is he needing to go to a counselor? He got voices in his head? No, no, no. It's a King James way of him saying, I had to check myself. I had to make sure I got my flesh in order. I'm right to be mad. What is happening is an injustice taking place. There are offenses taking place in our very midst with these people. Brother taking advantage of another brother. Children getting sucked up in it. Lands being swindled and finessed out of the hands of deserving people by people taking advantage of them in a bad situation. And I'm very angry, but what am I going to do? Before I say a word to anybody, let me get myself together. I can safely assume he prayed. The text doesn't say that, but I just, I guess I can suggest to us based on verse number seven, consulting yourself, getting your heart, mind, thoughts, and emotions in line. It would be a good thing to pray. It would be a good thing to look into God's word. Now, listen, listen, I want to be honest with you. Depending on what's going on, you may not always have the time frame. The conditions may not always be conducive to you tipping out of an office at work with a coworker, going to your car, saying a prayer, listening to some soft music and reading scripture. May not always present itself in that way. That's why as you study God's word and you learn God's word and you do more with God's word than just on Wednesday and Sunday, 
you know, them in between days, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Saturday. Yeah, there are certain things that the Holy Spirit can rest on your heart that in the time of trouble, you don't need to tip away. You need to run to your car, to the bathroom. You might need to, but you may not have an opportunity, but the Holy Spirit is there. He'll bring something up in your head. Be angry, but sin not. Okay, thank you, Lord. Blessed are the peacemakers. Okay, Lord, thank you. A brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city. Okay, Lord, thank you for that. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Uh-uh. Don't matter how many people are against you because when my enemies came up against me, when you know that you know that you know that you know that you're right, when my enemies came up against me, they stumbled and fell. Uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. You see, when you have these things already circulating on your heart, because that's the way that you daily live your life, you pray to walk in the spirit so that you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You remember Galatians 5, that one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is temperance. That means self-control. Another word would mean restraint. And oh, what a blessing it is in a heated situation for level heads to prevail, for spiritual heads to prevail. Because when emotions are high, logic is low. Oh, would to God that I had remembered and knew this and exercised this when I get mad at my kids. Uh, how many times in an argument has a husband said an untimely word to a wife or a wife to a husband? How many couples who were on a good track he might be the one. She might be the one. And some offense, some dispute happens. And because people didn't have control of their tongue, they didn't have mastery of their flesh because they didn't consult themselves. They said something. And sometimes when you say it, when a little time goes by and you cool down, oh, you can't take it back. And maybe you don't even regret what you said. You regret how you said it and how you do. You just like your daddy. You just like your mama and she ain't about nothing. You just like your brother. I ain't about studying him. And you say these things with a lack of restraint. I would venture to say, and you all can let me know how you feel. Oftentimes, this happens more in informal relationships parents to children, sibling, brother to sister, you know, husband to wife, because you're so comfortable with each other. You know, once you've been married longer than 10 seconds and you're watching the ball game and your wife standing in front of the TV, you, you, you pass in, hey, hey, excuse me, sweetie. You be like, will you move? Because you're so comfortable. And they know you don't mean it, mean it. And you don't really, when you say it, you don't mean it, mean it. But because you're just accustomed to being informal, it greases the track for you to have a lack of restraint and you may get into personal attacks with those that are so close to you. Nehemiah didn't want to do this. Lord, let it be to God. Ah, oh, my heart is just broken right now because I know I've done. Oh, not even so much at church or, but I know in my home, I'm like, oh. You could have did that so much better. Consult yourself. Nehemiah had the blessing of restraint. Because let me tell you some people. Words, I, I, I know we say sticks and stones can hurt, break my bones, but words will never harm me. That ain't true. Words have meaning that sometimes can linger. And sometimes the wound from words can linger much longer than any wound that you physically may have had. And I'm thankful for the godly example of Nehemiah. He says in verse six, oh, I was mad. Whoo, I was as hot as overburnt, overturned up fish grease. But I consulted myself, verse seven. And I had to do what was necessary. Rebuke the nobles and the leaders. And what did he do? 
You exact usury every one of his brothers. You are taking advantage of your brothers. Here's what Nehemiah does. Even though he's angry, he does something that we need to get to. He calls sin, sin. And he's saying this to the people who are responsible. He ain't telling 50 other people a message that is meant for these rulers and nobles. He's speaking to the people who need to hear the message. So when you have an offense, when you try to bring peace, don't be floating it around the people who ain't got nothing to do to it. Go to the people responsible. First of all, that will cause you to scratch where you itch. That's just a Pine Bluff country way of saying you'll be talking to the right people about the right things. Second of all, that also has a hidden blessing. It minimizes gossip because sometimes people can pour a hot piece of gossip in your ear. You know, I heard so and so, such and such. But if you go to that person who they are accusing of saying something nasty about you, it will make you think that don't even sound like her. That don't even sound like nothing he would say. And somebody will come to you with a nice hot piece of gossip. They will be upset with you. And you'll be like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm genuinely taken back. And then embarrassment sets in and all that stuff. And, and, you know, understandable. But when you go to the people who are directly involved, don't float it to 25 other people because now you're including people, <clears throat> pardon me, into something they really have no part to play in. I'll, I'll, I'll close by saying this. I received a call a year ago, maybe person was mad at me. I, I, I didn't realize they were mad. And they were mad because somebody had poured some gossip in their ear from something that supposedly took place 19 years ago. I was like, okay. And they were just really, you know, they weren't disrespectful or nasty, but with their tone, I could tell they were very upset. And I stopped them. I said, wait, 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 let, 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 let me say this. Let me say this. I want to be honest with you. I have no idea what you're talking about. I, 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 oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. They, they, they were convinced. I knew what they were talking about. And I said whatever. They never really said what I was supposed to have said. But whatever I said, they found out at this moment from something I'm supposed to say, eight, nine, ten years. I was like, I said, let me just say this to you. Ain't but two avenues here. Either somebody has given you some information about me from almost a decade ago, and they are absolutely right. And I was absolutely wrong to ever let those words come out of my mouth regarding you. And everything you're saying is right. And you are right to confront me and tell me you didn't appreciate that. That's Avenue one. Avenue two. And I said, now, excuse me for being plain. You making a fool out of yourself. And somebody who has given you whatever information is making a fool out of you, too. And I said, now, I don't know who told you what. Or don't, don't even tell me. I don't want to know. I said, but here's what I want you to do. Whoever told you this hot piece of gossip slash truth, examine their life. Is he or she a praying person? Is he or she someone that loves peace? Is he or she someone that is trying to bring the church together? Or are they someone on the other side of that? And if they knew this, why did they wait eight years to tell you? Ten years to tell you? Why didn't they tell you at the beginning? And if they didn't know at the beginning, that must mean they got it from somebody else. So now you got second, third. And I said, it, 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 just, it just falls. And when stuff like that happens, it must be addressed. I can say, I appreciate the person calling me. Normally that don't happen. I don't quite know if they believe me. I don't think they did. Because I did say these words now. You done stuck your foot in it now. I, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what incident you're referring to. I said, nah, I ain't going to act like I don't forget stuff. But what you saying, I'm just going to tell you, I got no clue. I know I don't, I don't even talk like that. I said, but, hey, you know, you done stepped in it now. So it's going to be, it would be a very hard sell to reverse track and say, I apologize for all this. I was wrong because you all, you, you way out there in the middle of the stream now. But my point is, when these things happen in that conversation, I had to consult myself. Because at one point, I'm like, now, nah, this is getting on my nerves. Now, I don't know what you're talking about. And you, you're almost talking kind of nasty to me. Now, I, 
I'm trying to enjoy my evening. But we have to consult ourselves. That is one time I can say in that situation, I got it right. But there's dozens, probably hundreds of times I didn't. So when I look at the blessing of restraint, Lord, set a watch over my lips. Yes, Lord. Set a guard over my heart. Lord, from, you know, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. Clean my heart. Purify my heart. Fix my heart. Let me walk in the spirit so that I do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let me exercise spiritual maturity, not just on Sunday and Wednesday, not just in front of the church, but as a way of living so that when these things come up, because they will come up, let these things happen to me. And yes, there's a human reaction. Yes, there's an anger, a very angry disposition we can have. But I pray to God that we can have the blessing of restraint to consult ourselves to say, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's, let me, let's regroup. Let's, let's talk this through. Listen, even if it's a parent talking to a child, now I guess it would depend on the age of the child and your relationship and their maturity. Of course, you can't talk to a three-year-old like you can a 30-year-old. So we get that. But parent to child. Okay, babe. Okay. Express yourself. Tell me how you feeling. How did mama make you feel? How did daddy make you feel? Okay, I hear you. You see, you have to consult yourself. You have to have restraint because if you just fire off, boom, boom, boom. Oftentimes people don't hear what you're saying. They only pick up on the anger and the aggression and that closes their ears to what you're saying. And so there is somebody who is an ultimate example of restraint. I'm talking about Jesus. When Jesus was brought before the high priest and the Sanhedrin council and they were making these accusations against him and they slapped him in the mouth, a Greek word that means to strike and to draw blood. They probably slapped him and pressed his mouth lip up against his teeth and busted his lip and he still stood there, didn't say a word. When he went before Pilate, talk about restraint. And Pilate is hearing this mob outside of his home, his palisade, his beautiful palatial estate. And he brings in Jesus. Can't you hear what they said about you, man? I paraphrase. Don't you know I've got the power to have you crucified or to set you free? With a restraining voice, he said, but you wouldn't have that power except my father in heaven had given it to you. And even when they took him to those illegal trials. Show me. Do, do, do a trick for me, Herod said. Send him back to Pilate. Pilate said, it ain't my jurisdiction. I ain't got nothing to do with this. I'm washing my hands of him. Even when they beat him, scourged him, hit him with the bat. This is why the old preachers would say he never said a mumbling word. There was no cursing. There was no profanity. There was no reviling. There was no uh, get back. There was no, I can't move. If I get down from here, I'm going to hurt you. No. When they nailed his hands, restraint. But he lost his composure when God took his presence away from him. Pouring out the judgment of sin, which is to be separated from the Lord forever. He lost his composure. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? The only time in eternity he did not feel the father's presence and it made him burst out in agony and pain. He lost his restraint right then. But yet we see Jesus is our ultimate example. He hung, bled, and died for our sins. Early Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power in his hand. Let me say to you people as we close, I commend you to know Jesus to surrender to him, to give your life to him, to let him be the captain of your salvation, the captain of your life. Jesus can and he will guide you to greener pastures. Yes, he will. And as it relates to restraint, friends, this ain't easy. Mm, Lord knows it's not easy. It's much easier to talk about it, to preach and teach it, than it is to actually practically flesh it out and live it. Because when somebody's talking crazy to you, when there's an offense going on, 
and you have that human reaction from your flesh and you want to respond the same way they're talking to you, uh -uh. just try to remember with the voice of the spirit. Listen, they don't set the rules. The rules of this engagement is not set by this person. He or she does not make the standard. So if they're nice, you're nice. But if they're mean, oh, I can get down there with you. No, you don't go by what they say or what they do. You go by what God's word says. Jesus has set the standard, not that person. And I know that will make you look in the world's eyes. It's not highly esteemed. You may look a certain way to the world, a negative way to the world, but we're not concerned about how the world views us. We have an audience of one, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want to say to all of you, I love you. I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, I'm certainly enjoying what I went through. It was beneficial to me. Lord, help me. So I appreciate all of you. I appreciate all of your time, and I pray you have a blessed rest of the day. There's no football on today because the Cowboys have been cheated out of their spot. So I'm not watching any football. I'm boycotting the NFL. I might watch the commercials for the Super Bowl. Maybe. But God bless all of you. I appreciate all of you. And I pray you enjoy the rest of your day.